Let me ask you to turn in your Bibles to James 2, James 2, 14 to 26. As we continue our study of the Christian life through the book of James, we come to James chapter 2, verses 14 to 26, which is a text about obedience. And this is the second uh, time that James has taken the opportunity to talk about obedience. And so this is Obedience in the Christian Life, part two. And this text that we're looking at tonight is actually the most controversial text in the book of James. And some people would argue that it is the most controversial text in the Bible. It has uh, received a whole big bunch of attention over the last 500 years since the Protestant Reformation as different scholars have tried to figure out how to make James fit with other writers in the New Testament like the Apostle Paul. And so we've got a lot we've got to do tonight in this text. In James chapter 2 verses 14 to 26, this is what God says. What use is it, my brethren, if someone says he has faith, but he has no works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and be filled, and yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead being by itself. But someone may well say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without the works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one. You do well. The demons also believe and shudder. But are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up Isaac, his son, on the altar? You see that faith was working with his works, and as a result of the works, faith was perfected. And then the scripture was fulfilled, which says, And Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. In the same way, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we trust you. We love you. We look forward to that day that Andrew just sang about when we get to heaven. We'll see you face to face. Conflict will be at an end. And there'll be nothing to shout about but the victory we have in you. And so, Father, I pray as your people that we would come to this text, this text that has been a challenge for so many, and that you would open our eyes, that you'd help us to see the truth that you mean to communicate to us, and that, Father, you would form and strengthen your church as your word takes root in us. And Father, we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to talk about speaking out of both sides of our mouths. People sometimes speak out of both sides of our mouths. In fact, the accusation has been here about this text that the Bible in this text is speaking out of both sides of its mouth. Sometimes when we talk about speaking out of both sides of our mouth, we mean that to be a bad thing, that you say one thing over here and another thing over there, and those two things are at odds. But it doesn't always have to be that way. Sometimes we can speak out of both sides of our mouths, and the speech is not at odds with one another. I want to demonstrate that to you by showing you a clip of something thing that I said in this church six months ago. This clip that you're getting ready to see is a few seconds, and it is one clip of the most controversial sermon I've ever preached at First Baptist. Uh, I say that because the emails and social media postings indicated that with some people this didn't go over real well. Uh, And so I want you to see a clip that kind of isolates how controversial 
what I said this six months ago on March 5th in a sermon on membership matters called giving. Here's the clip. What does it mean to be rich? You are rich, correct me if you think I'm wrong, but you're rich when you have a lot of money. Any objections? Okay. You're rich when you have a lot of money. And here's what Jesus says. He says you need to be rich toward God. He says you need to give God a lot of money. And so I am here today on behalf of the Son of God to say to you that you must give God a lot of your money. All right. You're laughing now. But uh, that my mom used to say, that went over like a pregnant pole vaulter with some people. All right. Now, I heard about that a lot. Heard about that a lot. A lot of people said nice things, but nobody has said as many negative things about any sermon I've preached except that one right there, March 5th. Now then, last week on November the 5th, six months to the day, I said this. respond to that grace. There's going to be people down here and in the back who want to talk to you and pray for you. We don't want one penny from you because God doesn't want it. We want to give you something. We want to give you life. And so you come as we continue in worship. All right. Now, I didn't hear a word about that one. All right. <laughs> Everybody loved that. Now, you hear both of those messages, just a few brief little clips, and they sound contradictory. It sounds like Lambert spoke out of both sides of his mouth. I am here on behalf of the Son of God to say, we want you to give God a lot of money. People start writing on their email. And then last week, we want you to respond to God's grace, and we don't want one penny from you. Everybody's like, I knew there was something about that guy I liked. They might sound contradictory, but you have to understand what was happening. Last week, I was preaching on a text that talked about our access to God and how that relates to our access in church, and that is not based on money. But six months ago in March, I was talking about a text that talks about our responsibility to steward every penny of God's money that he has given to us. And we are not allowed to be selfish with that money and hold on to it. But God commands and controls everything, and we don't have the right to kind of hang on to it. So a message that sounds contradictory when you understand the context, it actually is completely consistent. We do this all the time. I remember my dad, who was one of the kindest, most gentle men I knew. And one of the things that he always said to me, always said it, is, son, I'd do anything in this world for you. He said it just like that real fast. I'd do anything in this world for you. If you can understand what it, I'll slow it down for you. Son, I'd do anything in this world for you. He always said that, all the time. And then I was in the sixth grade, and I signed up for band. And all my friends were playing the trumpet. My older brother had played the trumpet, and I wanted to play the trumpet. And so I went to my dad, and I said, Dad, I want a trumpet. He said, no. I thought, what happened? I'd do anything in this world for you. Actually, I did, would never even thought of saying that to my father, actually. But that's what I thought. Whatever happened to, I'd do anything in this world for you. I just want a trumpet. Well, those two things weren't contradictory. He really did mean anything I could do for you, I would do for you. But he also had a job and certain obligations, and there came a time and a place when uh, there wasn't enough money left at the end of the month, and we had to say no to things. And a trumpet 
would have placed us outside the bounds of that. So we do these things all the time in our life. We say one thing over here and it's true, and we say another thing over here and it's true, and they're not contradictory. We just have to pay attention to the context. This is really important. Because one of the most easy ways to resolve an apparent contradiction is to understand that it's possible to address the very same subject from a different perspective and even from a multitude of different perspectives. This is so important when you're looking at this text in James chapter 2 because what everybody wants to say is that James in James chapter 2 sounds different than Paul in the book of Romans and the book of Galatians. The apostle Paul wants to talk about faith and you're saved by faith alone and then here comes James and he says no you got to do works and it seems like the message of the New Testament is one about grace through faith apart from works, and then here comes James and he throws a wrench in the whole system. Now, I don't want to just blow over that. I want the weight of this to catch you. And so what I want you to, I, I think you can see it in two verses, one from James chapter 2 verse 24 and one from Romans chapter 3. We're going to put them both up on the screen here. James 2 24, a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. Romans 3.28, a man is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Both of those texts are in the Bible, and they sound very different, don't they? Some people have thought they sound opposite. Well, let me tell you one thing before I start trying to explain this. One, one of the things that you need to understand is that James never does or says anything to undermine faith. In fact, he underlines faith. In James chapter 2, verse 1, he says, My brethren, do not hold your faith and our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. This is what we looked at last week. He's talking about the faith that we have in Jesus Christ, which makes us a part of the body of believers. In verse 5 of chapter 2, he says, Listen, my beloved brethren, did not God choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? You are saved by faith, and it's when you are rich in faith, not works, that you become an heir of the kingdom. James never does anything to undermine the importance of faith. He actually says some more about faith later on in the book, and we'll get to that uh, as, as time goes by here. But James realizes the importance of faith, but he's doing something different here. And what I want to do is make three comments or three observations about this apparent contradiction between what we saw in Romans chapter 3 from the Apostle Paul and now here in James chapter 2 from the Apostle James. Here's the first comment. The Bible is the inspired Word of God with no errors or contradiction. Turn in your Bibles to 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 to 21. This is a theology of Scripture right in two verses. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 to 21. But know this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. This is telling you how the Bible, how Scripture got written. The Bible is not the product of just some dude sitting down with some parchment and a quill pen and trying to figure out what wise expressions he could come up with on his own. Here the Scriptures are spoken of, the human authors are spoken of as God's quill pen. That people moved of God spoke every word God meant for them to say. This is... The biblical doctrine of inspiration, 
or accommodation, that God uses human beings to write down exactly what he wanted written down. So it is right that the head over this book that I just read from is 2 Peter, because Peter actually wrote the book with his background and his history and his interests and his emphasis. It's right that the book of James that we're looking at has James over it. It identifies him as the author because one day he sat down and he wrote this with all of his interest and all the things that made him James. It's right that the apostle Paul uh, is identified as the author of Romans because one day he sat down and wrote a letter to those people with everything that was true about him. And yet, even as Paul and James and Peter sat down to write a letter, the Bible tells us that they wrote every single word that God wanted them to write. So that we can say that the book of James really is a letter from James, but it is also the word of God. And if Romans is the word of God, and James is the word of God, then there will not be any contradiction because God doesn't lie. God's not confused. And so what we have to do is, this is hard. We have to submit. And we just have to look at these four times right here in this text of James chapter 2 and just say, okay, God says faith without works is dead. And so I'm going to try really, really hard to understand what God means and how he means it. And I'm going to say whatever he is trying to communicate, I am going to believe. And I'm just going to get on board with it. And I'm not going to get fussy and riled up and say, well, but Paul said this over here. Well, Paul did say that over here, and he said it under the inspiration of God. Well, but James says this right here. Yes, he does, and he says it under the inspiration of God. So when the Bible says it, we're just going to say God said it, and that's the end of it. So the Bible is the inspired word of God with no errors or contradiction, and we're just going to submit. Doesn't mean we don't need to work hard to understand what's going on. Doesn't mean we don't need to work hard to understand what it means to submit to James chapter 2 versus what it means to submit to Romans chapter 3. But it means we're not going to do this thing where we try to figure out which one is the true one. We're going to say they're both true, and the problem isn't with the words. The problem is with me. And God, help me to understand what you're trying to say. God, help me to have a heart to embrace what you've written. Don't go, why'd you write this, God? Just say, God, help me. Help me to get on board with what you're saying, because this is your word, and it's true. Here's the second comment. The same word can be used with different meanings. So, out of the soccer field Saturday, I heard one of the parents say, uh, man, we just can't catch a break. We need a break. And we could imagine somebody who didn't understand the multiple uses of the word break thinking, why does that person want their kid to break their leg? You can get a break on your bone and it's a bad thing. But when you get a break in a game, it's a good thing. And so what we have to do is understand, hey, diff the same word can have different meanings. And what we need to do is not get out the dictionary but first, listen to what the person is trying to communicate. This is what's going on with the word justify in James chapter 2. James chapter 2 verse 21 says, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up Isaac, his son, on the altar? 
He uses the word justify there. And Paul uses the word justify in Romans chapter 3. But we shouldn't assume that James uses the word justify the same way Paul does any more than we should assume that a cheering parent at a soccer game uses the word break the same way an ER doc uses the word break. In Romans chapter 3, verse 20, this is what the Apostle Paul says. By works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for through the law comes the knowledge of sin. In verse 24, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Verse 28, for we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Every time the Apostle Paul uses the word justify in those specific references, he's using it as a way to explain that how we are made right before God. Justify or justified means we are made right. We are declared to be right before God. And you are not declared to be right before God by the things you do, but by the faith you have in the one who has obeyed for you. And when you have faith in Jesus Christ, you are declared to be, his, to be righteous. You are declared to have his righteousness. And you are, as the Apostle Paul uses it there, justified. It's not the same way that James uses justify in James chapter 2, verse 21 that I just read. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up Isaac his son on the altar? It can't be that because you keep reading verse 22. You see that faith was working with his works, and as a result of the works, faith was perfected. So the faith came first, works came after. Verse 23, the scripture was fulfilled, which says Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. So what James does is he looks back at Genesis chapter 15, talk about this in a little while, and he says, that's where Abraham got the faith. That's where he was reckoned righteous. But then in Genesis 22, when he went to slay his son and his obedience was seen, then his faith was completed or perfected or shown. So when James uses the word justify here, he doesn't mean it in the sense of getting saved. He means it in the sense of proof or a demonstration of the authentic relationship that you have with God. So justify can be used as Paul uses it. You are saved. You are declared to be righteous. Or it can be used as James uses it. Your faith is demonstrated to be true. You are proving your faith. The Bible uses the, the word justify in that same way in other places. In Matthew chapter 12, verse 33, either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for the tree is known by its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you being evil speak what is good? For the mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. The good man brings out of his good treasure what is good, and evil man brings out of his evil treasure what is evil. But I tell you that every careless word that people speak they shall give an accounting for it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you'll be condemned. Jesus is not upending the order of salvation here. He's not saying, oh, I take it back. You don't need to come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. You just need to watch what you say. That's not what he means. What he's saying is your words justify you in the sense of proving whether or not your salvation in me is legitimate. The word justify is in the sense of demonstration. Actually, the Apostle Paul uses the word justify in the same sense in Romans chapter 3. In Romans chapter 3, verse 4, the Apostle Paul says, May it never be, rather let God be found true, though every man be found a liar, as it is written that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. And then if you, so he's saying, God, you need to be demonstrated as true when you speak. You need to be justified when you speak. He's quoting Psalm 51. 
And then just a few verses later, he's going to get down and use justify in a completely different sense. Because one word can be used in a multitude of ways, and you need to listen to what the author says to make sense of what they're trying to communicate. And so the same word can be used with different meanings. Same thing's happening with the word faith in James chapter 2. Paul uses faith as the passive looking to God for what only he can do. Faith is not something you do, it's something you have in God who has done everything for you. James doesn't view faith any differently, but you need to understand in James chapter 2, he's talking about false kinds of faith versus a true faith. In verse 14, he says, what use is it, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but has no works? Can that faith save him? For James, there's two faiths, two faiths. There's the faith that saves, and there is that faith that doesn't save. And what's the difference? The faith that saves is a faith that demonstrates trust in Christ with a changed life. And the faith that does not save is the faith that says, Jesus is great, love that guy, but there's never any change. And so we have to listen to what the authors say and not find contradiction because we're lazy. We have to not assume that because we hear a word we think we understand that that's what the author means. When I moved up to Boston to go to college, I got confused because a friend of mine that I had just met talked about this girl that I was interested in and said, she's wicked cool. Well. Uh, he did not mean that she was mean with a body temperature in the 70s. He meant she was awesome. But you just have to understand what he means. Wicked here means awesome. Cool means awesome. So three comments about this apparent contradiction. First, the Bible is the inspired word of God with no errors or contradictions. Second, the same word can be used with different meanings. And third, James and Paul write with two different perspectives and two different burdens. Paul pleads with men and women, boys and girls, not to believe that they can gain access to God through their good deeds, but only through faith in Jesus Christ. Don't think that you can be saved by what you do. Turn away from yourself and to Jesus Christ who has done everything for you and then just trust him. Quit thinking it's about you and your effort. That is Paul's appeal. And James' appeal is different. He pleads with men and women, boys and girls, not to believe that faith in Jesus does not lead to a changed life. James wants you to know when you come to Jesus Christ, he will change you. And if you have not been changed, then you haven't really come to Jesus. You don't have the faith you thought you had if there's no difference in your life. Paul is talking to people who need to gain admittance into the Christian life, and James is talking to people who must show that they have been admitted into the Christian life. James' point is that real saving faith will demonstrate itself in a changed life. Real saving faith will lead to works, to behavior that demonstrates that you know the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And so the application tonight is two questions. Here's the first question. Do you believe the Bible? The, the longer I'm a Christian and the more I see what happens to professing Christians, 
the more I believe this is just one of the most important questions on the face of the planet. Do you believe the Bible? Because here's what I see from high school students who go to college and from parents who go through a hard time with their children and from people who go through a significant trial in their life. One of the most easy things to do is to just decide you're going to pick and choose what parts of the Bible you're going to believe and what parts you're not going to believe. And when you do that, the Bible isn't your authority anymore. You are. You just pick and choose the parts you like. What it means to be a Christian is to just believe the Bible. And when the Bible says God made the world in six days, I'm just going to believe that. And when the Bible says a great big fish swallowed a person and sped him out after three days, I'm just going to believe that. And I'm not waiting for an archaeologist to find a great big fish in a rock formation somewhere and say, oh, there it is. I'm so glad somebody proved it. We're just going to believe it. And when the Bible says you're a sinner, I'm just going to believe it. And when the Bible says Jesus is 100% God and 100% man, I'm just going to believe it. And when the Bible says Jesus really, really died and then he really, really came back to life, I'm just going to believe it. It's, it's really that simple. You know what the alternative is? To believe whatever you can fit in your little head. That's the alternative. All of us have an authority. The question is, is it God in his word or is it me? The alternative is to say, well, I can't fit it in my head that God could send Jesus to the earth by a virgin. So since I can't fit it in my head, I'm going to call that ridiculous. <sighs> Just believe it. Just tr You're going to believe something. Do you want to believe what you can fit in your little puny little head? Or do you want to believe what God has spoken and has been attested to by millions and millions of witnesses? In just Jesus' example, 500 people saw the formerly dead guy walking around. Are you going to believe 500 people and God's word? Or are you going to say, because I can't fit that in my little tiny mind, I'm not going to believe it? You need to believe the Bible. And then here's the second question. Are you saved? Are you saved? James is so practical. You remember how we keep saying that? Dozens of you have come up to me around here and said, one of the reasons I love the book of James is because James is so practical. Well, here's where we see James' practicality. James is so practical that he doesn't want to just point you to the need you have for faith. He wants to help you understand whether you actually have the faith. And here's what James says, if you want to know if you're saved, he doesn't say, uh, ask yourself whether you pray to prayer. He doesn't say that. He doesn't say, ask yourself whether you remember walking down some aisle someplace. He doesn't say, do you remember a time when you cried real hard because you had an emotional experience in some church? He says, if you're saved, you'll know it because your life looks different. Does your life look different? And so I am talking to you. If you think you're saved because you remember something that happened to you 563 years ago. <laughs> but you're still looking at porn. And you're still lying to your friends. And you're still holding on to every little penny you've got because it's the most important thing in the whole world and you don't know what to do without it. 
And nothing's different. You, you still don't share the gospel because you're scared. I'm talking to you if you have a memory of this decision that you made back forever ago. And what James says is this. If you have the kind of faith that hasn't changed your life, you're dead. That's, that's not me. That's the Bible. God is not after your confession. God's after your whole life. And when you come to behold Jesus Christ as the King of kings and the Lord of lords, he will occupy more of your heart than a distant memory. He will change everything about you. So that the way you spend your money is different and the way you talk to your wife is different and the way you treat your husband is different and what you look at on the internet is different. Jesus Christ is after your life. And if your life is what it always was before you made a profession in Jesus, guess what? You never knew him. And it doesn't have to stay that way. <laughs> it's the good news of the gospel. That's the reason this text is here. So you would look at it and go, my life's not different. Jesus changed me. And you could turn a profession of faith into actual faith right now, tonight, by looking to Jesus Christ and saying, I want to be like you. Help me. Forgive me. Change me. And when you do that, you know what he'll do? He'll help you. He'll forgive you. And he'll change you. Let's stand and let's pray. Father in heaven, we want to appear before you tonight and we want to plead with you to save us from a dead faith that has words to speak about Jesus, but no behavior that demonstrates what Jesus has done. And so, Father, I want to pray that you would press in on the consciences of people in this room who have a memory of an experience with Jesus, who have good words to say about Jesus when the right people are listening, but they don't have a changed life and they have a dead faith. And Father, I want to ask you to impress upon the consciences of the people in this room who are just tempted to play eeny, meeny, miny, mo with the Bible. Father, I want to ask that you would keep First Baptist Church what it has always been, which is a church that is just very simply and very straightforwardly committed to and submissive to the Bible. Father, make us to be people who are committed to your truth and not care if people think we're stupid. Not care if people think we're old-fashioned. Not care if people think we're simplistic. But we would just stand on your truth and stand on the grace of your Son and call people to repent of their sins and trust in Jesus Christ. Father, I pray that we would do that now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to have a time of response so that you can turn from sin to Christ. Some of you are in here tonight and you don't know Jesus Christ. And you need to turn from sin to Jesus. You need to turn from a path that is all about you and what you can fit in your mind and turn to the Word of God and submit to it.
And you need to turn from a path where you're trying to do everything you can do to live a good and a happy life. And you need to turn to Jesus Christ who has secured eternal life for you. Others of you, you're in here tonight and you have heard the name of Jesus. But you would say, my life hasn't been different. And I want to have a living faith, not a dead faith. Some of you would say, I want to turn from the struggle to do eeny, meeny, miny, mo on the Bible. And I just want to be a person who sits underneath the Word of God and it takes it for whatever it says. Whichever one of those people you are, this time is for you. And so you come. There's going to be people down here and people in the back. And as we respond by singing, you come. The 